Chapter One of Psychopathology of Everyday Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mary Schneider. Psychopathology of Everyday Life by Sigmund Freud. Translated by A. A. Brill. Chapter One forgetting of proper names during the year eighteen ninety eight i published a short essay on the psychic mechanism of forgetfulness i shall now repeat its content and take it as a starting point for further discussion i have there undertaken a psychologic analysis of a common case of temporary forgetfulness of proper names and from a pregnant example of my own observation i have reached the conclusion that this frequent and practically unimportant occurrence of a failure of a psychic function of memory admits an explanation which goes beyond the customary utilization of this phenomenon if an average psychologist should be asked to explain how it happens that we often fail to recall a name which we are sure we know he would probably content himself with the answer that proper names are more apt to be forgotten than any other content of memory. He might give plausible reasons for this forgetting preference for proper names, but he would not assume any deep determinant for the process. I was led to examine exhaustively the phenomenon of temporary forgetfulness through the observation of certain peculiarities which, although not general, can nevertheless be seen clearly in some cases. In these there is not only forgetfulness, but also false recollection. He who strives for the escaped name brings to consciousness others, substitutive names, which, although immediately recognized as false, nevertheless obtrude themselves with great tenacity. The process which should lead to the reproduction of the lost name is, as it were, displaced, and thus brings one to an incorrect substitute. Now it is my assumption that the displacement is not left to psychic arbitrariness, but that it follows lawful and rational paths. In other words, I assume that the substitutive name or names stand in direct relation to the lost name, and I hope, if I succeed in demonstrating this connection, to throw light on the origin of the forgetting of names. In the example which I selected for analysis in 1898, I vainly strove to recall the name of the master who made the imposing frescoes of the Last Judgment in the Dome of Orvieto. Instead of the lost name, Signorelli, two other names of artists, Botticelli and Boltraffio, obtruded themselves, names which my judgment immediately and definitely rejected as being incorrect. When the correct name was imparted to me by an outsider, I recognized it at once, without any hesitation. The examination of the influence and association paths which caused the displacement from Signorelli to Botticelli and Boltraffio led to the following results. A. The reason for the escape of the name Signorelli is neither to be sought in the strangeness in itself of this name, nor in the psychologic character of the connection in which it was inserted. The forgotten name was just as familiar to me as any of the substitutive names, Botticelli, and somewhat more familiar than the other substitute, Boltraffio, of the possessor of which I could hardly say more than that he belonged to the Milanese school. The connection, too, in which the forgetting of the name took place appeared to me harmless, and had no further explanation. I journeyed by carriage with a stranger from Ragusa Dalmatia to a station in Herzegovina. Our conversation drifted to traveling in Italy, and I asked my companion whether he had been in Orvieto and had seen there the famous frescoes of... B. The forgetting of the name could not be explained until after I had recalled the theme discussed immediately before this conversation. This forgetting then made itself known as a disturbance of the newly emerging theme 
caused by the theme preceding it. In brief, before I asked my traveling companion if he had been in Orvieto, we had been discussing the customs of the Turks living in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I had related what I heard from a colleague who was practicing medicine among them, namely that they show full confidence in the physician and complete submission to fate. When one is compelled to inform them that there is no help for the patient, they answer, Sir, Herr, what can I say? I know that if he could be saved, you would save him. In these sentences alone we can find the words and names Bosnia, Herzegovina, Herr, or Sir, which may be inserted in an association series between Signorelli, Botticelli, and Boltrafio. C. I assume that the stream of thoughts concerning the customs of the Turks in Bosnia, etc., was able to disturb the next thought because I withdrew my attention from it before it came to an end. For I recalled that I wished to relate a second anecdote which was next to the first in my memory. These Turks value the sexual pleasure above all else, and its sexual disturbance merge into an utter despair, which strangely contrasts with their resignation at the peril of losing their lives. One of my colleague's patients once told him, For you know, sir, Herr, if that ceases, life no longer has any charm. I refrained from imparting this characteristic feature, because I did not wish to touch upon such a delicate theme in conversation with a stranger. But I went still further. I also deflected my attention from the continuation of the thought, which might have associated itself in me with the theme, Death and Sexuality. It was at that time, under the after-effects of a message which I had received a few weeks before, during a brief sojourn in Trafoy, a patient on whom I had spent much effort had ended his life on account of an incurable sexual disturbance. I know positively that this sad event, and everything connected with it, did not come to my conscious recollection on that trip in Herzegovina. However, the agreement between Trafoy and Boltrafio forces me to assume that this reminiscence was at that time brought to activity despite all the intentional deviation of my attention. D. I can no longer conceive the forgetting of the name Signorelli as an accidental occurrence. I must recognize in this process the influence of a motive. There are motives which actuated the interruption in the communication of my thoughts concerning the customs of the Turks, etc., and which later influenced me to exclude from my consciousness the thought connected with them, and which might have led to the message concerning the incident in Trafoy, that is, I wanted to forget something, I repressed something. To be sure, I wished to forget something other than the name of the master of Orvieto, but this other thought brought about an associative connection between itself and this name, so that my act of volition missed the aim, and I forgot the one against my will, while I intentionally wished to forget the other. The disinclination to recall directed itself against the one content. The inability to remember appeared in another. The case would have been obviously simpler if this disinclination and the inability to remember had concerned the same content. The substitutive names no longer seem so thoroughly justified as they were before this explanation. They remind me, after the form of a compromise, as much of what I wished to forget as of what I wished to remember, and show me that my object to forget something was neither a perfect success nor a failure. E. The nature of the association formed between the lost name and the repressed theme, death and sexuality, etc., containing the names of Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Trafoy, is also very strange. In the scheme inserted here, which originally appeared in 1898, an attempt is made to graphically represent these associations. 
the name signorelli was thus divided into two parts one pair of syllables elli returned unchanged in one of the substitutions while the other had gained through the translation of signor sir hair many and diverse relations to the name contained in the repressed theme but was lost through it in the reproduction its substitution was formed in a way to suggest that a displacement took place along the same associations herzegovina and bosnia regardless of the sense and acoustic demarcation the names were therefore treated in this process like the pictures of a sentence which is to be transformed into a picture puzzle or rebus no information was given to consciousness concerning the whole process which instead of the name signorelli was thus changed to the substitutive names at first sight no relation is apparent between the theme that contained the name signorelli and the repressed one which immediately preceded it i now describe the graphic the word signorelli is at the top left the signor portion is in a box one line leads from that signor to the word herzegovina where the her is in a box and another line from signor leads to hair as in sir what can i say that has a line leading to the topic death and sexuality that has a line leading to repressed thoughts in the middle of the graph is the word botticelli with the b o in a circle down from that is a line leading to the word bosnia with the b o in a circle to the right of that is the word boltrafio with the b o in a circle back to the repressed thoughts a line leading to the right comes to the word trafoy and trafoy has a line leading to trafio the end of botrafio that's the graph perhaps it is not superfluous to remark that the given explanation does not contradict the conditions of memory reproduction and forgetting assumed by other psychologists which they seek in certain relations and dispositions only in certain cases have we added another motive to the factors long recognized as causative in forgetting names and have thus bared the mechanisms of faulty memory the assumed dispositions are indispensable also in our case in order to make it possible for the repressed element to associatively gain control over the desired name and take it along into the repression perhaps this would not have occurred in another name having more favorable conditions of reproduction for it is quite probable that a suppressed element continually strives to assert itself in some other way but attains this success only where it meets with suitable conditions at other times the suppression succeeds without disturbance of function or as we may justly say without symptoms when we recapitulate the conditions for forgetting a name with faulty recollection we find one a certain disposition to forget the name two a process of suppression which has taken place shortly before and three the possibility of establishing an outer association between the concerned name and the element previously suppressed the last condition will probably not have to be much overrated for the slightest claim on the association is apt in most cases to bring it about but it is a different and further reaching question whether such outer association can really furnish the proper condition to enable the suppressed element to disturb the reproduction of the desired name or whether after all a more intimate connection between the two themes is not necessarily required on superficial consideration one may be willing to reject the latter requirement and consider the temporal meeting in perfectly dissimilar contents as sufficient but on more thorough examination one finds more and more frequently that the two elements the repressed and the new one connected by an outer association possess besides a connection in content 
and this can also be demonstrated in the example signorelli the value of the understanding gained through the analysis of the example signorelli naturally depends on whether we must explain this case as a typical or as an isolated process i must now maintain that the forgetting of a name associated with faulty recollection uncommonly often follows the same process as was demonstrated in the case of signorelli almost every time that i observed the phenomenon in myself i was able to explain it in the manner indicated above as being motivated by repression i must mention still another viewpoint in favor of the typical nature of our analysis i believe that one is not justified in separating the cases of name forgetting with faulty recollection from those in which incorrect substitutive names have not obtruded themselves these substitutive names occur spontaneously in a number of cases in other cases where they do not come spontaneously they can be brought to the surface by concentration of attention and they then show the same relation to the repressed element and the lost name as those that come spontaneously two factors seem to play a part in bringing to consciousness the substitutive names first the effort of attention and second the inner determinant which adheres to the psychic material i could find the latter in the greater or lesser facility which forms the required outer association between the two elements a great many of the cases of name forgetting without faulty recollection therefore belong to the cases with substitutive name formation the mechanism of which corresponds to the one in the example signorelli but i surely shall not venture to assert that all cases of name forgetting belong to the same group there is no doubt that there are cases of name forgetting that proceed in a much simpler way we shall represent this state of affairs carefully enough if we assert that besides the simple forgetting of proper names there is another forgetting which is motivated by repression. End of chapter 1forgetting of foreign words the ordinary vocabulary of our own language seems to be protected against forgetting within the limits of normal function but it is quite different with words from a foreign language the tendency to forget such words extends to all parts of speech in fact depending on our own general state and the degree of fatigue the first manifestation of functional disturbances evinces itself in the irregularity of our control over foreign vocabulary in a series of cases this forgetting follows the same mechanism as the one revealed in the example signorelli as a demonstration of this i shall report a single analysis characterized however by valuable features concerning the forgetting of a word not a noun from the latin quotation before proceeding allow me to give a full and clear account of this little episode last summer while journeying on my vacation i renewed the acquaintance of a young man of academic education who as i soon noticed was conversant with some of my works in our conversation we drifted i no longer remember how to the social position of the race to which we both belonged he being ambitious bemoaned the fact that his generation as he expressed it was destined to grow crippled that it was prevented from developing its talents and from gratifying its desires he concluded his passionately felt speech with a familiar verse from virgil exoriare in which the unhappy dido leaves her vengeance upon aeneas to posterity instead of concluded i should have said wished to conclude for he could not bring the quotation to an end and attempted to conceal the open gap in his memory by transposing the words exoriare ex nostris osibus ultor he finally became piqued and said 
please don't make such a mocking face as if you were gloating over my embarrassment but help me there is something missing in this verse how does it read in its complete form with pleasure i answered and cited it correctly exoriare aliquis nostris es oxibus ultor it is too stupid to forget such a word he said by the way i understand you claim that forgetting is not without its reasons i should be very curious to find out how i came to forget this indefinite pronoun aliquis i gladly accepted the challenge as i hoped to get an addition to my collection and said we can easily do this but i must ask you to tell me frankly and without any criticism everything that occurs to your mind after you focus your attention without any particular intention on the forgotten word very well the ridiculous idea comes to me to divide the word in the following way ah and liquis what does that mean i don't know what else does that recall to you the thought goes on to reliques liquidation liquidity fluid does that mean anything to you now no not by a long shot just go ahead i now think he said laughing sarcastically of simon of trent whose relics i saw two years ago in a church in trent i think of the old accusation which has been brought against the jews again and of the work of klein paul who sees in these supposed sacrifices reincarnations or revivals so to speak of the saviour this stream of thought has some connection with the theme which we discussed before the latin word escaped you you are right i now think of an article in an italian journal which i have recently read i believe it was entitled what st augustine said concerning women what can you do with this i waited now i think of something which surely has no connection with the theme oh please abstain from all criticism and oh i know i recall a handsome old gentleman whom i met on my journey last week he was really an original type he looked like a big bird of prey his name if you care to know is benedict well at least you give a grouping of saints and church fathers st simon st augustine st benedict i believe that there was a church father named origines three of these moreover are christian names like paul in the name klein paul now i think of st januarius and the blood miracle i find that the thoughts are running mechanically just stop a moment both st januarius and st augustine have something to do with the calendar will you recall to me the blood miracle don't you know about it the blood of st januarius is preserved in a phial in a church in naples and on a certain holiday a miracle takes place causing it to liquefy the people think a great deal of this miracle and become very excited if the liquefying process is retarded as happened once during the french occupation the general in command or garibaldi if i am not mistaken then took the priest aside and with a very significant gesture pointed out to him the soldiers arrayed without and expressed his hope that the miracle would soon take place and it actually took place well what else comes to mind why do you hesitate something really occurred to me but it is too intimate a matter to impart besides i see no connection and no necessity for telling it i will take care of the connection of course i cannot compel you to reveal what is disagreeable to you but then you should not have demanded that i tell you why you forgot the word aliquis really do you think so well i suddenly thought of a woman from whom i could easily get a message that would be very annoying to us both that she missed her courses how could you guess such a thing that was not very difficult you prepared me for it long enough just think of the saints of the calendar the liquefying of the blood on a certain day the excitement if the event does not take place and the distinct threat that the miracle must take place indeed you have elaborated the miracle of st januarius into a clever allusion to the courses of the woman it was surely without my knowledge and do you really believe that my inability to produce the word aliquis was due to this anxious expectation that appears to be absolutely certain don't you recall dividing it into a ah, liquis and the associations reliques liquidation fluid 
shall i also add to the connection the fact that saint simon to whom you got by way of the reliquies was sacrificed as a child please stop i hope you do not take these thoughts if i really entertain them seriously i will however confess to you that the lady is italian and that i visited naples in her company but may not all this be coincidental i must leave to your own judgment whether you can explain all these connections through the assumption of coincidence i will tell you however that every similar case that you analyze will lead you to just such remarkable coincidences i have more than one reason for valuing this little analysis for which i am indebted to my travelling companion first because in this case i was able to make use of a source which is otherwise inaccessible to me most of the examples of psychic disturbances of daily life that i have here compiled i was obliged to take from observation of myself i endeavored to evade the far richer material furnished me by my neurotic patients because i had to preclude the objection that the phenomena in question were only the result and manifestation of the neurosis it was therefore of special value for my purpose to have a stranger free from a neurosis offer himself as a subject for such examination this analysis is also important in other respects inasmuch as it elucidates a case of word forgetting without substitutive recollection and this confirms the principle formulated above namely that the appearance or non-appearance of incorrect substitutive recollections does not constitute an essential distinction but the principal value of the example aliquis lies in another of its distinctions from the case of signorelli in the latter example the reproduction of the name becomes disturbed through the after-effects of a stream of thought which began shortly before and was interrupted but whose content had no distinct relation to the new theme which contained the name signorelli between the repression and the theme of the forgotten name there existed only the relation of temporal contiguity which reached the other in order that the two should be able to form a connection through an outer association on the other hand in the example aliquis one can note no trace of such an independent repressed theme which could occupy conscious thought immediately before and then re-echo as a disturbance the disturbance of the reproduction proceeded here from the inner part of the theme touched upon and was brought about by the fact that unconsciously a contradiction arose against the wish idea represented in the quotation the origin must be construed in the following manner the speaker deplored the fact that the present generation of his people were being deprived of its rights and like dido he presaged that a new generation would take upon itself vengeance against the oppressors he therefore expressed the wish for posterity in this moment he was interrupted by the contradictory thought do you really wish so much for posterity that is not true just think in what a predicament you would be if you should now receive the information that you must expect posterity from the quarter you have in mind no you want no posterity as much as you need it for your vengeance this contradiction asserts itself just as the example signorelli by forming an outer association within one of his ideation elements and an element of the repressed wish but here it is brought about in a most strained manner through what seems an artificial detour of associations another important agreement with the example signorelli results from the fact that the contradiction originates from repressed sources and emanates from thoughts which would cause a deviation of attention so much for the diversity and inner relationship of both paradigms of the forgetting of names we have learned to know a second mechanism of forgetting namely the disturbance of thought through an inner contradiction emanating from the repression in the course of this discussion we shall repeatedly meet with this process which seems to me to be the more easily understood footnote finer observation reduces somewhat the contrast between the analyses of signorelli and aliquis as far as the substitutive recollections are concerned here too the forgetting seems to be accompanied by substitutive formations 
when i later asked my companion whether in his effort to recall the forgotten word he did not think of some substitution he informed me that he was at first tempted to put an ab into the verse nostris ab osibus perhaps the disjointed part of a liquis and that later the word exoriare obtruded itself with particular distinctness and persistency being sceptical he added that it was apparently due to the fact that it was the first word of the verse but when i asked him to focus his attention on the associations to exoriare he gave me the word exorcism this makes me think that the reinforcement of exoriare in the reproduction was really the value of such substitution it probably came through the association exorcism from the names of the saints however those are refinements upon which no value need be laid it seems now quite possible that the appearance of any kind of substitutive recollection is a constant sign perhaps only characteristic and misleading of the purposive forgetting motivated by repression this substitution might also exist in the reinforcement of an element akin to the thing forgotten even where incorrect substitutive names fail to appear thus in the example of signorelli as long as the name of the painter remained inaccessible to me i had more than a clear visual image of the cycle of his frescoes and of the picture of himself in the corner at least it was more intensive than any of my other visual memory traces in another case also reported in my essay in eighteen ninety eight i had hopelessly forgotten the street name and address connected with a disagreeable visit in a strange city but as if to mock me the house number appeared especially vivid whereas the memory of numbers usually causes me the greatest difficulty End of chapter two Chapter three of Psychopathology of Everyday Life. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Mary Schneider. Psychopathology of Everyday Life by Sigmund Freud. Translated by A. A. Brill. Chapter three. Forgetting of Names and Order of Words. Experiences like those mentioned concerning the process of forgetting a part of the order of words from a foreign language may cause one to wonder whether the forgetting of the order of words in one's own language requires an essentially different explanation. To be sure, one is not wont to be surprised that after a while a formula or poem learned by heart can only be reproduced imperfectly, with variations and gaps. Still, as this forgetting does not affect equally all the things learned together but seems to pick out therefrom definite parts it may be worth our effort to investigate analytically some examples of such faulty reproductions brill reports the following example while conversing one day with a very brilliant young woman she had occasion to quote from keats the poem was entitled ode to apollo and she recited the following lines in thy western house of gold where thou livest in thy state bards that once sublimely told prosaic truths that come too late she hesitated many times during the recitation being sure that there was something wrong with the last line to her surprise on referring to the book she found that not only was the last line misquoted but that there were many other mistakes the correct lines read as follows ode to apollo in thy western halls of gold when thou sittest in thy state bards that erst sublimely told heroic deeds and sang of fate the words italicized emphasized are those that have been forgotten and replaced by others during the recitation she was astonished at her many mistakes and attributed them to failure of memory i could readily convince her however that there was no qualitative or quantitative disturbance of memory in her case and recalled to her our conversation immediately before quoting these lines we were discussing the overestimation of personality among lovers and she thought it was victor hugo who said that love is the greatest thing in the world because it makes an angel or a god out of a grocery clerk she continued only when we are in love have we blind faith in humanity everything is perfect everything is beautiful and everything is so poetically unreal 
still it is a wonderful experience without going through notwithstanding the terrible disappointments that usually follow it puts us on a level with the gods and incites us to all sorts of artistic activities we become real poets we not only memorize and quote poetry but we often become apollos ourselves she then quoted the lines given above when i asked on what occasion she memorized the lines she could not recall as a teacher of elocution she was wont to memorize so much and so often that it was difficult to tell just when she had memorized these lines judging by the conversation i suggested it must seem that this poem is intimately associated with the idea of overestimation of personality of one in love have you perhaps memorized this poem when you were in such a state she became thoughtful for a while and soon recalled the following facts twelve years before when she was eighteen years old she fell in love she met the young man while participating in an amateur theatrical performance he was at the time studying for the stage and it was predicated that some day he would be a matinee idol he was endowed with all the attributes needed for such a calling he was well built fascinating impulsive very clever and very fickle-minded she was warned about him but she paid no heed attributing it all to the envy of her counsellors everything went well for a few months when she suddenly received word that her apollo for whom she had memorized these lines had eloped and married a very wealthy young woman a few years later she heard that he was living in a western city where he was taking care of his father-in-law's interests the misquoted lines are now quite plain the discussion about the overestimation of personality among lovers unconsciously recalled to her a disagreeable experience when she herself overestimated the personality of the man she loved she thought he was a god but he turned out to be even worse than the average mortal the episode could not come to the surface because it was determined by very disagreeable and painful thoughts but the unconscious variations in the poem plainly showed her present mental state the poetic expressions were not only charged to prosaic ones but they clearly alluded to the whole episode another example of forgetting the order of words of a poem well known to the person i shall cite from dr c g jung quoting words of the author a man wished to recite the familiar poem a pine tree stands alone etc in the lines he felt drowsy he became hopelessly stuck at the words with the white sheet this forgetting of such a well-known verse seemed to me rather peculiar and i therefore asked him to reproduce what came to his mind when he thought of the words with the white sheet he gave the following series of associations the white sheet makes one think of a white sheet on a corpse a linen sheet with which one covers dead people now i think of a near friend his brother died quite recently he is supposed to have died of heart disease he was also very corpulent my friend is corpulent too and i thought that he might meet the same fate probably he doesn't exercise enough when i heard of this death i suddenly became frightened the same thing might happen to me as my own family is predisposed to obesity my grandfather died of heart disease i also am somewhat too corpulent and for that reason i began an obesity cure a few days ago jung remarks the man had unconsciously immediately identified himself with the pine tree which was covered with a white sheet for the following example of forgetting the order of words i am indebted to my friend dr ferenczi of budapest unlike the former examples it does not refer to a verse taken from poetry but to a self-coined saying it may also demonstrate to us the rather unusual case where the forgetting places itself at the disposal of discretion when the latter is in danger of yielding to a momentary desire the mistake thus advances to a useful function after we have sobered down we justify that inner striving which at first could manifest itself only by way of inability as in forgetting or psychic impotence Quote, at a social gathering some one quoted tout comprendre c'est tout pardonner to which i remarked that the first part of the sentence should suffice as pardoning is an exemption which must be left to god and the priest 
one of the guests thought this observation very good which in turn emboldened me to remark probably to ensure myself of the good opinion of the well-disposed critic that some time ago i thought of something still better but when i was about to repeat this clever idea i was unable to recall it thereupon i immediately withdrew from the company and wrote my concealing thoughts i first recalled the name of the friend who had witnessed the birth of this desired thought and of the street in budapest where it took place and then the name of another friend whose name was max whom we usually called maxi that led me to the word maxim and to the thought that at that time as in this present case it was a question of varying a well-known maxim strangely enough i did not recall any maxim but the following sentence god created man in his own image and its changed conception man created god in his own image immediately i recalled the sought-for recollection my friend said to me at that time in andrecy street nothing human is foreign to me to which i remarked basing it on psychoanalytic experience you should go further and acknowledge that nothing animal is foreign to you but after i had finally found the desired recollection i was even then prevented from telling it in this social gathering the young wife of the friend whom i had reminded of the animality of the unconscious was also among those present and i was perforce reminded that she was not at all prepared for the reception of such unsympathetic views the forgetting spared me a number of unpleasant questions from her and a hopeless discussion and just that must have been the motive of the temporary amnesia it is interesting to note that as a concealing thought there emerged a sentence in which the deity is degraded to a human invention while in the sought-for sentence there was an allusion to the animal in the man the capitis diminutio is therefore common to both the whole matter was apparently only a continuation of the stream of thought concerning understanding and forgiving which was stimulated by the discussion that the desired thought so rapidly appeared may be also due to the fact that i withdrew into a vacant room away from the society in which it was censored i have since then analyzed a large number of cases of forgetting or faulty reproduction of the order of words and the consistent result of these investigations led me to assume that the mechanisms of forgetting as demonstrated in the examples aliquis and ode to apollo are almost of universal validity it is not always very convenient to report such analyses for just as those cited they usually lead to intimate and painful things in the person analyzed i shall therefore add no more to the number of such examples what is common to all these cases regardless of the material is the fact that the forgotten or distorted material becomes connected through some associative road with an unconscious stream of thought which gives rise to the influence that comes to light as forgetting i am now returning to the forgetting of names concerning which we have so far considered exhaustively neither the casuistic element nor the motives as this form of faulty acts can at times be abundantly observed in myself i am not at a loss for examples the slight attacks of migraine from which i am still suffering are wont to announce themselves hours before through the forgetting of names and at the height of the attack during which i am not forced however to give up my work i am often unable to recall all proper names still just such cases as mine may furnish the cause for a strong objection to our analytic efforts should not one be forced to conclude from such observations that the causation of the forgetfulness especially the forgetting of names is to be sought in circulatory or functional disturbances of the brain and spare himself the trouble of searching for psychologic explanations for these phenomena not at all that would mean to interchange the mechanism of a process which is the same in all cases with its variations but instead of an analysis i shall cite a comparison which will settle the argument let us assume that i was so reckless as to take a walk at night in an uninhabited neighborhood of a big city and was attacked and robbed of my watch and purse at the nearest police station i report the matter in the following words 
i was in this or that street and was there robbed of my watch and purse by lonesomeness and darkness although these words would not express anything that is incorrect i would nevertheless run the danger of being considered judging from the wording of this report as not quite right in the head to be correct the state of affairs could only be described by saying that favored by the lonesomeness of the place and under cover of darkness i was robbed of my valuables by unknown malefactors now then the state of affairs in forgetting names need not be different favored by exhaustion circulatory disturbances and intoxication i am robbed by an unknown psychic force of the disposal over the proper names belonging to my memory it is the same force which in other cases may bring about the same failure of memory during perfect health and mental capacity when i analyze these cases of name forgetting occurring in myself i find almost regularly that the name withheld shows some relation to a theme which concerns my own person and is apt to provoke in me strong and often painful emotions following the convention and commendable practice of the zurich school bluller jung Ricklin, i might express the same thing in the following form the name withheld has touched a personal complex in me the relation of the name to my person is an unexpected one and is mostly brought about through superficial associations words of double meaning and of similar sounds it may generally be designated as a side association a few simple examples will best illustrate the nature of the same a a patient requested me to recommend to him a sanatorium in the riviera i knew of such a place very near genoa i also recalled the name of the german colleague who was in charge of the place but the place itself i could not name well as i believed i knew it there was nothing left to do but ask the patient to wait and to appeal quickly to the women of the family just what is the name of the place near genoa where dr x has his small institution in which mr so-and-so remained so long under treatment of course you would forget a name like that the name is nervy to be sure i have enough to do with nerves b another patient spoke about a neighboring summer resort and maintained that besides the two familiar inns there was a third i disputed the existence of any third inn and referred to the fact that i had spent seven summers in the vicinity and therefore knew more about the place than he instigated by my contradiction he recalled the name the name of the third inn was the hawkwartner of course i had to admit it indeed i was forced to confess that for seven summers i had lived near this very inn whose existence i had so strenuously denied but why should i have forgotten the name and the object i believe because the name sounded very much like that of a vienna colleague who practiced the same specialty as my own it touched me in my professional complex c on another occasion when about to buy a railroad ticket on the reichenhall station i could not recall the very familiar name of the next big railroad station where i had so often passed i was forced to look it up in the timetable the name was rose home rosenheim i soon discovered through what associations i lost it an hour earlier i had visited my sister in her home near reichenhall my sister's name is rose hence also a rose home this name was taken away by my family complex d this predatory influence of the family complex i can demonstrate in a whole series of complexes one day i was consulted by a young man younger brother of one of my female patients whom I saw any number of times, and whom I used to call by his first name. Later, while wishing to talk about his visit, I forgot his first name, in no way an unusual one, and could not recall it in any way. I walked into the street to read the business signs, and recognized the name as soon as it met my eyes. The analysis showed that I had formed a parallel between the visitor and my own brother, which centered in the question, would my brother in a similar case have behaved like him or even more contrarily the outer connection between the thoughts concerning the stranger and my own family was rendered possible through the accident that the name of the mothers in each case was the same amelia 
Subsequently, I also understood the substitutive names Daniel and Frank, which obtruded themselves without any explanation. These names, as well as Amelia, belong to Schiller's play The Robbers. They are all connected with the joke of the Vienna pedestrian Daniel Spitzer. E. On another occasion, I was unable to find a patient's name which had a certain reference to my early life. The analysis had to be followed over a long, devious road before the desired name was discovered. The patient expressed his apprehension lest he should lose his eyesight. This recalled a young man who became blind from a gunshot, and this again led to a picture of another youth who shot himself, and the latter bore the same name as the first patient, though not at all related to him. The name became known to me, however, only after the anxious apprehension from these two juvenile cases was transferred to a person of my own family thus an incessant stream of self-reference flows through my thoughts concerning which i usually have no inkling but which betrays itself through such name forgetting it seems as if i were forced to compare with my own person all that i hear about strangers as if my personal complexes became stirred up at every information from others it seems impossible that this should be an individual peculiarity of my own person it must on the contrary point to the way we grasp outside matters in general i have reasons to assume that other individuals meet with experiences quite similar to mine the best example of this kind was reported to me by a gentleman named letterer as a personal experience while on his wedding trip in venice he came across a man with whom he was but slightly acquainted and whom he was obliged to introduce to his wife as he forgot the name of the stranger he got himself out of the embarrassment the first time by mumbling the name unintelligibly but when he met the man a second time as is inevitable in venice he took him aside and begged him to help him out of the difficulty by telling him his name which he unfortunately had forgotten the answer of the stranger pointed to a superior knowledge of human nature i readily believe that you did not grasp my name my name is like yours letterer one cannot suppress a slight feeling of unpleasantness on discovering his own name in a stranger i had recently felt it very plainly when i was consulted during my office hours by a man named s freud however i am assured by one of my own critics that in this respect he behaves in quite the opposite manner f the effect of personal relation can be recognized also in the following examples reported by jung mr y falls in love with a lady who soon thereafter marries mr x in spite of the fact that mr y was an acquaintance of mr x and had business relations with him he repeatedly forgot the name and on a number of occasions when wishing to correspond with x he was obliged to ask other people for his name however the motivation for the forgetting is more evident in this case than in the preceding ones which were under the constellation of personal reference here the forgetting is manifestly a direct result of the dislike of y the happy rival he does not wish to know anything about him g the following case reported by forenzi the analysis of which is especially instructive through the explanation of substitutive thoughts like botticelli botrofio for signorelli shows in a somewhat different way how self-reference leads to the forgetting of the name a lady who heard something about psychoanalysis could not recall the name of the psychiatrist jung instead the following names occurred to her k1 a name wild nietzsche hauptmann i did not tell her the name and requested her to repeat her free associations to every thought to k1 she at once thought of mrs k1 that she was an embellished and affected person who looked very well for her age she does not age as a general and principal conception of wild and nietzsche she gave the association mental disease but then added jocosely the freudians will continue looking for the cases of mental diseases until they themselves become insane she continued 
I cannot bear Wilde and Nietzsche. I do not understand them. I hear that they were both homosexual. Wilde has occupied himself with young people. Although she muttered in the sentence the correct name, she still did not remember it. To Houtman she associated the words half and youth, and only after I called her attention to the word youth did she become aware that she was looking for the name young, young. It is clear that this lady, who had lost her husband at the age of thirty-nine, and had no prospect of marrying a second time, had cause enough to avoid reminiscences recalling youth or old age. The remarkable thing is that the concealing thoughts of the desired name came to the surface as simple associations of content, without any sound associations. H. Still different and very finely motivated is an example of name forgetting which the person concerned has himself explained. While taking an examination in philosophy as a minor subject, I was questioned by the examiner about the teachings of Epicurus, and was asked whether I knew who took up his teachings centuries later. I answered that it was Pierre Gassendi, whom two days before, while in a café, I had happened to hear spoken of as a follower of Epicurus. To the question how I knew this, I boldly replied that I had taken an interest in Gassendi for a long time. This resulted in a certificate with a magna cum laude, but later, unfortunately, also in a persistent tendency to forget the name Gassendi. I believe that it is due to my guilty conscience that even now I cannot retain this name despite all efforts. I had no business knowing it at that time. To add here another example of forgetting the name of a city, an instance which is perhaps not as simple as those given before, but which will appear credible and valuable to those more familiar with such investigations. The name of an Italian city withdrew itself from memory on account of its far-reaching sound similarity to a woman's first name, which was in turn connected with various emotional reminiscences, which were surely not exhaustively treated in this report. Dr. S. Ferenzi, who observed this case of forgetting in himself, treated it quite justly as an analysis of a dream or an erotic idea. Today I visited some old friends, and the conversation turned to cities of northern Italy. Someone remarked that they still showed the Austrian influence. A few of these cities were cited. I, too, wished to mention one, but the name did not come to me, although I knew that I had spent two very pleasant days there. This, of course, does not quite concur with Freud's theory of forgetting. Instead of the desired name of the city, there obtruded themselves the following thoughts. Capua, Brescia, the Lion of Brescia. This lion I saw objectively before me in the form of a marble statue, but I soon noticed that he resembled less the lion of the Statue of Liberty in Brescia, which I saw only in a picture, than the other marble lion which I saw in Lucerne, on the monument in honor of the Swiss guard fallen in the Tuileries. I finally thought of the desired name. It was Verona. I knew at once the cause of this amnesia, no other than a former servant of the family whom I visited at the time. Her name was Veronica, in Hungarian Verona. I felt a little antipathy for her on account of her repulsive physiognomy, as well as her hoarse, shrill voice and her unbearable self-assertion, to which she felt herself entitled on account of her long service. Also, the tyrannical way in which she treated the children of the family was insufferable to me. Now I knew the significance of the substitutive thoughts. To Capua I immediately associated Caput Mortuum. I had often compared Veronica's head to a skull. The Hungarian word kapsoi, greed after money, surely furnished a determinant for the displacement. Naturally, I also found those more direct associations which connected Capua and Verona as geographical ideas and as Italian words of the same rhythm. The same held true for Brescia. Here, too, I found concealed sidetracks of associations of ideas. My antipathy at that time was so violent that I thought Veronica very ugly, and have often expressed my astonishment at the fact that anyone should love her. Why, to kiss her, I said, must provoke nausea. 
brescia at least in hungary is very often mentioned not in connection with the lion but with another wild beast the most hated name in this country as well as in north italy is that of general hainau who is briefly referred to as the hyena of brescia from the hated tyrant hainau one stream of thought leads over brescia to the city of verona and the other over the idea of the grave-digging animal with the hoarse voice which corresponds to the thought of a monument to the dead to the skull and to the disagreeable organ of veronica which was so cruelly insulted in my conscious mind veronica in her time ruled as tyrannically as did the austrian general after the hungarian and italian struggles for liberty lucerne is associated with the idea of the summer which veronica spent with her employers in a place nearer lucerne the swiss guard again recalls that she tyrannized not only the children but also the adult members of the family and thus played the part of the guard dame i expressly observe that this antipathy of mine against v consciously belongs to things long overcome since that time she has changed in her appearance and manner very much to her advantage so that i am able to meet her with sincere regard to be sure i hardly find such occasion as usual however my unconscious sticks more tenaciously to those impressions it is old in its resentment the tuileries represent an allusion to a second personality an old french lady who actually guarded the women of the house and who was in high regard and somewhat feared by everybody for a long time i was her élève in french conversation the word élève recalls that when i visited the brother-in-law of my present host in northern bohemia i had to laugh a great deal because the rural population referred to the élèves pupils of the school of forestry as lowen lions also this jocose recollection might have taken part in the displacement of the hyena by the lion i the following example can also show how a personal complex swaying the person at the time being may by devious ways bring about the forgetting of a name two men an elder and a younger who had travelled together in sicily six months before exchanged reminiscences of those pleasant and interesting days let's see what was the name of that place asked the younger where we passed the night before taking the trip to selenut calatafini was it not the elder rejected this by saying certainly not but i have forgotten the name too although i can recall perfectly all the details of the place whenever i hear someone forget a name it immediately produces forgetfulness in me let us look for the name i cannot think of any other names except kautanaseta which is surely not correct no said the younger the name begins with or contains a w but the italian language contains no w retorted the older i really meant a v and i said w because i am accustomed to interchange them in my mother tongue the elder however objected to the v he added i believe that i have already forgotten many of the sicilian names suppose we try to find out for example what is the name of the place situated on a height which was called enna in antiquity oh i know that castra giovanni in the next moment the younger man discovered the lost name he cried out castel vetrano and was pleased to be able to demonstrate the supposed v for a moment the elder still lacked the feeling of recognition but after he accepted the name he was able to state why it had escaped him he thought obviously because the second half vetrano suggests veteran i am aware that i am not quite anxious to think of aging and react peculiarly when i am reminded of it thus for example i had recently reminded a very esteemed friend in most unmistakable terms that he had long ago passed the years of age because before this he once remarked in the most flattering manner i am no longer a young man that my resistance was directed against the second half of the name castelvetrano is shown by the fact that the initial sound of the same returned in the substitutive name caltanisetta what about the name caltanisetta itself asked the younger that also seemed to me like a pet name of a young woman admitted the elder somewhat later he added 
the name for enna was always only a substitutive name and now it occurs to me that the name castro giovanni which obtruded itself with the aid of a rationalization alludes as expressly to giovanni young as the last name castelvetrano to veteran the older man believed that he had thus accounted for his forgetting the name what the motive was that led the young man to this memory failure was not investigated in some cases one must have recourse to all the fineness of psychoanalytical technique in order to explain the forgetting of a name those who wish to read an example of such work i refer to a communication by professor e jones i could multiply the examples of name forgetting and prolong the discussion very much further if i did not wish to avoid elucidating here almost all the viewpoints which will be considered in later themes i shall however take the liberty of comprehending in a few sentences the results of the analyses reported here the mechanism of forgetting or rather of losing or temporary forgetting of a name consists in the disturbance of the intended reproduction of the name through a strange stream of thought unconscious at the time between the disturbed name and the disturbing complex there exists a connection either from the beginning or such a connection has been formed perhaps by artificial means through superficial outer associations the self-reference complex personal family or professional proves to be the most effective of the disturbing complexes a name which by virtue of its meaning belongs to a number of thought associations complexes is frequently disturbed in its connection to one series of thoughts through a stronger complex belonging to the other associations to avoid the awakening of pain through memory is one of the objects among the motives of these disturbances in general one may distinguish two principal cases of name forgetting when the name itself touches something unpleasant or when it is brought into connection with other associations which are influenced by such effects so that names can be disturbed on their own account or on account of their nearer or more remote associative relations in the reproduction a review of these general principles readily convinces us that the temporary forgetting of a name is observed as the most frequent faulty action of our mental functions however we are far from having described all the peculiarities of this phenomenon i also wish to call attention to the fact that name forgetting is extremely contagious in a conversation between two persons the mere mention of having forgotten this or that name by one often suffices to induce the same memory slip in the other but whenever the forgetting is induced the sought-for name easily comes to the surface there is also a continuous forgetting of names in which whole chains of names are withdrawn from memory if in the case of endeavoring to discover an escaped name one finds others with which the latter is intimately connected it often happens that these new names also escape the forgetting thus jumps from one name to another as if to demonstrate the existence of a hindrance not to be easily removed End of chapter three psychopathology of everyday life this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Mary Schneider. Psychopathology of Everyday Life by Sigmund Freud. Translated by A. A. Brill. Chapter 4 Childhood and Concealing Memories. In a second essay, I was able to demonstrate the purposive nature of our memories in an unexpected field. I started with the remarkable fact that the earliest recollections of a person often seem to preserve the unimportant and accidental, whereas, frequently, though not universally, not a trace is found in the adult memory of the weighty and effective impressions of this period. As it is known that the memory exercises a certain selection among the impressions at its disposal, it would seem logical to suppose that this selection follows entirely different principles in childhood than at the time of intellectual maturity. 
However, close investigation points to the fact that such an assumption is superfluous. The indifferent childhood memories owe existence to a process of displacement. It can be shown by psychoanalysis that in the reproduction they represent the substitute for other really significant impressions whose reproduction is hindered by some resistance. As they do not owe their existence to their contents, but to an associative relation of their contents to another repressed thought, they deserve the title of concealing memories by which I have designated them. In the aforementioned essay, I only touched upon, but in no way exhausted, the varieties in the relations and meanings of concealed memories. In the given example fully analyzed, I particularly emphasized a peculiarity in temporal relation between the concealing memory and the contents of the memory concealed by it. The content of the concealing memory in that example belonged to one of the first years of childhood while the thoughts represented by it, which remained practically unconscious, belonged to a later period of the individual in question. I called this form of displacement a retroactive or regressive one. Perhaps more often one finds the reversed relation, that is, an indifferent impression of the most remote period becomes a concealing memory in consciousness which simply owes its existence to an association with an earlier experience, against whose direct reproduction there are resistances. We would call these encroaching or interposing concealing memories. What most concerns the memory lies here chronologically beyond the concealing memory. Finally, there may be a third possible case, namely the concealing memory may be connected with the impression it conceals, not only through its content, but also through contiguity in time. This is the contemporaneous or contiguous concealing memory. How large a portion of the sum total of our memory belongs to the category of concealing memories, and what part it plays in various neurotic hidden processes, these are problems into the value of which I have neither inquired nor shall I enter here. I am concerned only with emphasizing the sameness between the forgetting of proper names with faulty recollection and the formation of concealing memories. At first sight it would seem that the diversities of both phenomena are far more striking than their exact analogies. There we deal with proper names here with complete impressions experienced either in reality or in thought. There we deal with a manifest failure of the memory function, here with the memory act which appears strange to us. Again, there we are concerned with a momentary disturbance, for the name just forgotten could have been reproduced correctly a hundred times before, and will be so again from tomorrow on. Here we deal with lasting possession without a failure, for the indifferent childhood memories seem to be able to accompany us through a great part of life. In both these cases the riddle seems to be solved in an entirely different way. There it is the forgetting, while here it is the remembering which excites our scientific curiosity. After deeper reflection, one realizes that though there is a diversity in the psychic material and in the duration of time of the two phenomena, yet these are by far outweighed by the conformities between the two. In both cases, we deal with the failure to remember what should be correctly reproduced by memory fails to appear, and instead something else comes as a substitute. In the case of forgetting a name, there is no lack of memory function in the form of name substitution. The formation of a concealing memory depends on the forgetting of other important impressions. In both cases, we are reminded by an intellectual feeling of the intervention of a disturbance, which in each case takes a different form. In the case of forgetting of names, we are aware that the substitutive names are incorrect, in concealing memories, we are surprised that we have them at all. Hence, if psychological analysis demonstrates that the substitutive formation in each case is brought about in the same manner, that is, through displacement along a superficial association, 
we are justified in saying that the diversities in material in duration of time and in the centering of both phenomena serve to enhance our expectation that we have discovered something that is important and of general value this generality purports that the stopping and straying of the reproducing function indicates more often than we suppose that there is an intervention of a prejudicial factor a tendency which favors one memory and at the same time works against another the subject of childhood memories appears to me so important and interesting that i would like to devote to it a few additional remarks which go beyond the views expressed so far how far back into childhood do our memories reach i am familiar with some investigations on this question by v and c henry and potwin they assert that such examinations show wide individual variations inasmuch as some trace their first reminiscences to the sixth month of life while others can recall nothing of their lives before the end of the sixth or even the eighth year but what connection is there between these variations in the behavior of childhood reminiscences and what significance may be ascribed to them it seems that it is not enough to procure the material for this question by simple inquiry but it must later be subjected to a study in which the person furnishing the information must participate i believe we accept too indifferently the fact of infantile amnesia that is the failure of memory for the first years of our lives and fail to find in it a strange riddle we forget of what great intellectual accomplishments and of what complicated emotions a child of four years is capable we really ought to wonder why the memory of later years has as a rule retained so little of these psychic processes especially as we have every reason for assuming that these same forgotten childhood activities have not glided off without leaving a trace in the development of the person but that they have left a definite influence for all future time yet in spite of this unparalleled effectiveness they were forgotten this would suggest that there are particularly formed conditions of memory in the sense of conscious reproduction which have thus far eluded our knowledge it is possible that the forgetting of childhood gives us the key to understanding of amnesias which according to our newer studies lie at the basis of the formation of all neurotic symptoms of these retained childhood reminiscences some appear to us readily comprehensible while others seem strange or unintelligible it is not difficult to correct certain errors in regard to both kinds if the retained reminiscences of a person are subjected to an analytic test it can be readily ascertained that a guarantee for their correctness does not exist some of the memory pictures are surely falsified and incomplete or displaced in point of time and place the assertions of persons examined that their first memories reach back perhaps to their second year are evidently unreliable motives can soon be discovered which explain the disfigurement and the displacement of these experiences but they also demonstrate that these memory lapses are not the result of a mere unreliable memory powerful forces from a later period have molded the memory capacity of our infantile experiences and it is probably due to these same forces that the understanding of our childhood is generally so very strange to us the recollection of adults as is known proceeds through different psychic material some recall by means of visual pictures their memories are of a visual character other individuals can scarcely reproduce in memory the most paltry sketch of an experience we call such persons auditifs and moteurs in contrast to the visuels terms proposed by charcot these differences vanish in dreams all our dreams are predominantly visual but this development is also found in childhood memories the latter are plastic and visual even in those people whose later memory lacks the visual element the visual memory therefore preserves the type of the infantile recollections only my earliest childhood memories are visual character they represent plastic depicted scenes comparable only to stage settings 
in these scenes of childhood whether they prove true or false one usually sees his childish person both in contour and dress this circumstance must excite our wonder for adults do not see their own persons in their recollections of later experience it is moreover against our experiences to assume that the child's attention during his experiences is centered on himself rather than exclusively on outside impressions various sources force us to assume the so-called earliest childhood recollections are not true memory traces but later elaborations of the same elaborations which might have been subjected to the influence of many later psychic forces thus the childhood reminiscences of individuals altogether advance to the significance of concealing memories and thereby form a noteworthy analogy to the childhood reminiscences as laid down in the legends and myths of nations whoever has examined mentally a number of persons by the method of psychoanalysis must have gathered in this work numerous examples of concealing memories of every description however owing to the previously discussed nature of the relations of the childhood reminiscences to later life it becomes extraordinarily difficult to report such examples for in order to attach the value of the concealing memory to an infantile reminiscence it would be often necessary to present the entire life history of the person concerned only seldom is it possible as in the following good example to take out from its context and report a single childhood memory a twenty-four-year-old man preserved the following picture from the fifth year of his life in the garden of a summer-house he sat on a stool next to his aunt who was engaged in teaching him the alphabet he found difficulty in distinguishing the letter m from n and begged his aunt to tell him how to tell one from the other his aunt called his attention to the fact that the letter m had one whole portion a stroke more than the letter n there was no reason to dispute the reliability of the childhood recollection its meaning however was discovered only later when it showed itself to be the symbolic representation of another boyish inquisitiveness for just as he wanted to know the difference between m and n in that time so he concerned himself later about the difference between boy and girl and he would have been willing that just this aunt should be his teacher he also discovered that the difference was a similar one that the boy again had one portion more than the girl and at the time of this recognition his memory awoke to the corresponding childish inquisitiveness i would like to show by one more example the sense that may be gained by a childhood reminiscence through analytic work although it may seem to contain no sense before in my forty-third year when i began to interest myself in what remained in my memory of my own childhood a scene struck me which for a long time as i afterwards believed had repeatedly come to consciousness and which through reliable identification could be traced to a period before the completion of my third year i saw myself in front of a chest the door of which was held open by my half-brother twenty years my senior i stood there demanding something and screaming my mother pretty and slender then suddenly entered the room as if returning from the street in these words i formulated this scene so vividly seen which however furnished no other clue whether my brother wished to open or lock the chest in the first explanation it was a cupboard why i cried and what bearing the arrival of my mother had all these questions were dim to me i was tempted to explain to myself that it dealt with the memory of a hoax by my older brother which was interrupted by my mother such misunderstandings of childhood scenes retained in memory are not uncommon we recall a situation but it is not centralized we do not know on which of the elements to place the psychic accent analytic effort led me to an entirely unexpected solution of the picture i missed my mother and began to suspect that she was locked in the cupboard or chest and therefore demanded that my brother should unlock it as he obliged me and i became convinced that she was not in the chest i began to cry 
this is the moment firmly retained in the memory which was directly followed by the appearance of my mother who appeased my worry and anxiety but how did the child get the idea of looking for the absent mother in the chest dreams which occurred at the same time pointed dimly to a nurse concerning whom other reminiscences were retained as for example that she conscientiously urged me to deliver to her the small coins which i received as gifts a detail which in itself may lay claim to the value of a concealing memory for later things i then concluded to facilitate for myself this time the task of interpretation and asked my mother about that nurse i found out all sorts of things among others the fact that this shrewd but dishonest person had committed extensive robberies during the confinement of my mother and that my half-brother was instrumental bringing her to justice this information gave me the key to the memory from childhood as through a sort of inspiration the sudden disappearance of the nurse was not a matter of indifference to me i had just asked this brother where she was probably because i had noticed that he had played a part in her disappearance and he evasive and witty as he is to this day answered that she was boxed in i understood this answer in the childish way but asked no more as there was nothing else to be discovered when my mother left shortly thereafter i suspected that the naughty brother had treated her in the same way as he did the nurse and therefore pressed him to open the chest i also understand now why in the translation of the visual childhood scene my mother's slenderness was accentuated she must have struck me as being newly restored i am two and a half years older than the sister born that time and when i was three years of age i was separated from my half-brother chapter four